I'm not sure if I like that, but okay. Hello and welcome to the two-man power trip of wrestling. I'm your host, JP John Paz. Of course, we have a very, very special guest today. He's from the legendary Crockett family, former color commentator for the NWA, of course, former executive producer for WCW. He is Mr. David Crockett. David, welcome to the two-man power trip. How are you doing? John, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, you said you're not a legend. I thought that was crazy. Yeah. Of course <laughs> you're a legend. Come on, legendary family. No. Uh, well... I could say that uh, my my father is, you know, he started the company in 1933 uh, with boxing, uh, the show and dances, Tommy Dorsey, Glenn Miller. Uh, then he went on and he kept on running into this boxing and wrestling commission. And he finally said, well, what is wrestling? So he, that's how he got into wrestling. You know, that because of those commissions and he said well you know i'm a promoter i'll promote anything i mean good grief he promoted long ranger and lassie so yeah he'd, he'd promote anything when did he get into the nwa do you remember like about what was like the 50s i want to say all right it was luthes i remember him coming through who else? Uh, probably late 40s, early 50s. You know, the stronghold with the NWA was uh, with uh, St. Louis, Sam Mushnick. Yep. And, and that group, you, you had Vince Sr. Uh, with the WWF, but he was also a member of the NWA. Did you know that? Yes. Yeah, and then you know you had uh, who else? You had the AWA in Mid South, out west. You had Mike LaBelle in California, Don Owen up in Washington State, the Funks in Texas. I mean, it was a very wide group of territories at that time. You know, you were not supposed to go out of your area and in most cases nobody did but then there was always you know well let's see if we can step over the line and you know and that got into way back when before my time pretty rough in that sugar in the gas tank burning their wrestling ring uh you know uh stealing talent it was it was something else, you know. My father never told me that, but uh, some of the old timers that uh, worked for him, and then when they couldn't wrestle anymore, you know, like you know, I had a, a wrestler, Wally Dusick. Uh, he, matter of fact, Wally used to wrestle some in carnivals before he got with my father, and he, Johnny Heideman, who came out of uh, New York. Uh, and then, of course, we had Klondike Bill towards uh, the latter part. Good old Klondike Bill. Who's oh, yeah. WCW forever, right? And yes. WCW. <laughs> right. And then uh, he went on to help us. Uh, he was part of the grounds crew. We owned a double-A baseball franchise, the Charlotte O's, which were affiliated, affiliated with Baltimore. Uh, he was the, the grounds crew for that. Wow. Followed you guys forever. Damn. Yeah. So when you started making your foray into wrestling, how did you kind of get involved? Just because, hey, you know, Jim Crockett Sr.'s son, you're automatically going to be christened into the wrestling business? Uh, oh, no. Oh, no. no or he didn't no, want no. you in. No, no, he didn't. Oh, wow. Yeah. See, I was the last one to go into the business. Let's say that. But uh, before that, as a kid, it was, you know, I wanted to earn money. Okay. So... It was selling programs, taking tickets. Uh, when I could drive, we put out posters uh, around around the Charlotte area at that time. Then I would run tapes to different TV stations. Then I would transport my father to uh, different cities once I was driving. Then I also helped Wally Dusick. Uh, with the ring 
you know, and Wally was there again, that, that old wrestler. And I had some gloves. I must've been about 14 at the time. God, those boards were heavy. And he, I had gloves on and he said, take those gloves off. Well, then I'd get splinters and everything in my hands and you got to toughen you up. But, uh, you know, no, my father did not want me in wrestling. You know, I had, uh, I had, uh, two brothers, you know, Jimmy and Jackie, uh, that were in the business. And then my sister and her, I should say her husband, John Ringley, uh, he was the first one, then they got divorced and then he left. So, but I was one that really always, I wasn't talking about the business as far as the promotion in, I guess I was intrigued with the television in of the business. And that's what really uh, excited me. You know, I, cause he used to produce the program at WBT in Charlotte channel three and uh, every Wednesday night. And I would go there and, you know, just watching the cameraman and, I would be, go up in the control room and just, it was, I loved it. It was total chaos, of course, but, you know, because they didn't know what was going on, you know, because there again, it was always, you know, the cafe, you know, it was, you know, we, we would not let anybody know what was happening. And uh, it was, it's pretty, matter of fact, my dad never really smarted me up. It's just, you know, he didn't say, hey, this is a work. He said, there's an easy way and a hard way. Which way would you want to do it? So. Wow. Yeah. And then I didn't even realize this till recently, but you actually tried to be a wrestler at one point, right? Well, he, because I was there again, single at the time. I was an amateur wrestler. And I, you know, he said, we don't have anybody in the family that un that has been in that side of the business, you know, that understands somewhat that side of the business. So, I went, eh, okay. And that was around, you know, Jack and Jerry Briscoe, Thunderbolt Patterson. Uh, I had, uh, let me see, it was Gene Anderson and Rip Hawk are the ones that worked with me. Uh, but I, you know, I did it for about a year and then uh, I guess asthma. I had asthma that uh, couldn't figure out why, you know, that in the, the dust and the rings and all that, that act, I didn't know I had it until, you know, I was gasping for air. I think out of Columbia, they had to take me by the, the hospital and I got a, a shot of adrenaline, I think it was. So wow. that, that killed it. Wow. And yeah. you're wrestling under not David Crockett, right? David Finley. Yeah, that's my middle name. So, any yeah. like memorable matches or nothing? As no, I was a jobber. Did. I was a jobber. I, you know, in, in other words, I could count the lights uh, in the the building. Yeah. <laughs> and 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 the the simple thing was, you have to learn how to lose before you learn how to win. You know, that was. Uh, that was uh, what all the wrestlers told me. I guess when they were beating me, they told me that. But uh, I remember the wrestler that I, I wrestled in, in front of my father at Park Center, uh, Johnny Heideman. And he was from the New York and the Bronx, a uh, Sicilian. And I hit him with a forearm. And he said, afterwards, he said, David, and all my life, even being hit by a policeman with his billy club, I haven't been hit that hard. I said, well, tell you the truth, Johnny. If she, somebody shot me, I wouldn't I wouldn't die there because I was so pumped up, you know. It, you know and it was, you know. But that was the last time I wrestled from my father. It was best for everybody. <laughs> but I understood. You know, I bitched about payments. I mean, you know, the payoffs. Uh, you know, I might wrestle two matches and, and I said, what is this? Yeah. So 
Yeah, he, my dad said, yeah, you're one of the guys. But it helped me learn the psychology of the ring uh, and how the truly good wrestlers would work the crowd, how they would do certain things until they, they had them, you know, in the palm of their hand, and then they could manipulate them uh, up and down because they're again the bad guy in most cases was the person that led the match, you know, and just, it was amazing. Some of the, the conversations that go on in a wrestling ring that nobody hears, you know, except the, the, the referee and the, and the wrestlers, you know, it's, it's a, it's an art art form. You know, it really is uh, to be able to go out and, and, and it's ad lib. The only thing you really know is the ending supposedly. Uh, but, you know, as far as whether it's 15 minutes, 20 minutes, an hour, 90 minutes, you know, all that in between. No, that, that was not arranged. It wasn't planned. And so those, those good wrestlers, you know, and, you know, we, we were lucky enough to have quite a few uh, could go out there and really entertain and and be true professionals with Oli and Gene. I could imagine them not oh. being so easy on you. Oh that, no, Gene especially. Gene, he had his hands were so, you know, what is it? Carl Gotch, I think, or uh, would take and crush an apple with his hands. Well, Gene, yep. those he would do that. He could do that, but he loved doing. Uh, he, you know, the arm, the hand thing. And, and, you know, so he would act like it's killing him, but he's killing you. He's squeezing your hands or he'd come in and just pinch you. Uh, he, 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 he. <laughs> and Ollie, Ollie, he just, he enjoyed just wearing you out. Yeah. Uh, they, and, you know, and, they were constant motion. Oli uh, seems like a bit of an ornery guy, even still to this day. Very ornery. Type he's opinionated. Guy. I would say he's opinionated, which he's always been. And you know, you you have to listen and and sort of filter it to see you know exactly you know what he's talking about. You know, you've got people that bitch and bitch and bitch. But that's just their personality. You know, they have a always have a no good, very bad day. And only always has a no good, very bad day. You know, or the, the kid that it's always raining on him. Well, you know, that's that's only. But there again, smart. You know, he was he was a good booker, excellent wrestler. You know, I wish in, in a lot of cases he could coach wrestlers, you know, but he was so knowledgeable about the psychology of wrestling that, but he, he couldn't get it over, I think, to some of the younger wrestlers, you know, it, and it's, it's hard, you know, it, because, you know, they, every young wrestler comes in and think, oh, I've got it. And I've been to this training school and, and nah, you don't. You know, the camera has to like you. Uh, you have to pay attention to the audience. They have to like you or hate you. Uh, that you have to have the gift of gab as far as being able to be current with your conversation, get the point across, and not be stale, not always picking up uh, somebody's else, somebody else's sayings. You know, I, I hear that so much. And, and no, use your own words, not somebody else's. Be your own person. You know, uh, you don't try to copy. You know, be original. Yep. 
it's funny a few years ago i called Oli to do a personal appearance because i had Arn. so i'm like oh it'd be great Arn goes call at your own risk so you know i call him and <laughs> <laughs> he, he basically he goes oh uh, yeah f off not interested blah 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 I'm right like, whoa and Arn was like well you knew that was going to happen. I was like, yeah, I guess. But it's funny. His wife called me back. She goes, I apologize. He's not in good health. He just, he doesn't want to do it. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Sorry. He went about it that way. I'm like, Hey, that's, that's him to a T. That's exactly the way I thought it was going to go. Yeah. Down. You know, and I, yeah. And he's miserable, I'm sure. Because, you know, to be in a wheelchair, yep. you know, and to, he, I don't say he has somewhat dementia. I would think uh, just he forgets things and, but he was one of the best. He and Gene, they, they complimented each other. Gene was not a talker. He was a worker. You know, that, you know, you, you have some tag teams that everybody wants to talk. Nah, Gene could care less. I stuck a mic in front of him one time and he looked at me and said, <laughs> and this is, Talk to Oli. Yeah. It's funny because Oli, Gene, and really Blackjack kind of set the set the tone for Flair, really. I mean, yes. In essence. Yeah. yeah, Flair came in as the Ramblin' Rickus Rhodes. That's what he wanted to be. And he was like the Pillsbury Doughboy. He was so pumped up, you could pop him with a pin. Uh, and But he was an Anderson. You know, and plus he was also also gorgeous George. And he just he had that that charisma, that natural uh camera like thing, but you know, as far as the wrestling ability, he had the stamina, definitely. Uh, but then we started putting with the top talent. You know, he learned from the very best. He didn't he didn't learn from uh, jobbers and, and middle card wrestlers. He learned for the very best at that time. And, and if he screwed up, you know, in the ring, they would let him know in a very stern way, I guess you could say. With him too, you guys were in that horrible plane crash in yes. 75. Who That's else? Right. Was it Tim Woods and Johnny Valentine? Tim Woods. All right. Let me look at the plane. Okay. We had the pilot. Uh, Barry. What's Barry's last name? Farsi. Then Johnny Valentine was in the co-pilot seat. Tim Woods was behind the pilot. Rick was behind Valentine. I was behind Tim Woods and Bob Bruggers who was wrestling at that time. He used to play for the Miami Dolphins. He was sitting next to me. And Bruggers broke his back. Valentine broke his back. Rick cracked his. The pilot went through the dash. Tim Woods, I went through the seat my head and cracked the ribs right along the spine, you know, towards the, the spine in the back. I had a severe concussion. I was probably... I think my wife said that it was at least six months before I started coming around. Uh, I dislocated my shoulder, which they didn't even know until I started. They got ready to re release me. They tried to give me crutches, and, and this right arm wouldn't work. I broke my ankle, shattered teeth. Uh, and I was really didn't know that until because I was so stitched up. I had so many facial injuries that uh, they didn't know that until I got back to Charlotte and uh, the dentist uh, that we were using at the time, he said, no wonder he's screaming when you try to give him something warm or cold. The nerves are just hanging there. So, And most of this, my wife told me, because I basically have very little memory. I think I remember some things, but then, too, it might be somebody told told them to me. Uh, I did 
stay, Rick and I stayed in the same room. My wife said I was raising so much hell uh, in a room by myself that, you know, I wanted to be with Rick. And so they finally put me in there with him. So uh, I think Tim left that that night. Uh, I don't know much about it, but I do, I do remember about, all right, it was a 45 minute flight. Okay. And we about Florence, South Carolina, which is about halfway. Uh, he feathered, I want to say the right engine. You know, it was a twin engine Cessna Navajo. And I don't know why we didn't land, you know, in Florence or Lumberton, North Carolina. They both have small airports, which could handle that. But he chose to go on. And I, I think I remembered that going over the Cape Fear River, the left engine started and then, you know, I'm sitting there and our son was two weeks old. So I'm trying to practice Lamaze because I didn't want to get the, get knocked out. The wind knocked out of me. So I'm bending over trying to control my breathing. And I thought I saw a, a buzzer go off and a little before that Eastern airlines, there was a, crash an eastern airlines crash in charlotte uh it was foggy and the pilot just flew it into the ground and they were putting low warning lights in planes and, and to me i thought that was it but uh, uh my father-in-law who uh, was a pilot said no that was a stall warning so uh then after reading the faa report then okay i know i know the stall warning was when he tried to it was coming in and there was a water tower uh, that he was getting too close to and he tried to pull up and it stalled. And then he went, hit a railroad embankment. Wow. Yeah. Scary stuff. Jeez. I call, I call Rick every year. You know, say so let's bend over and kiss each other. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy. And, and to yeah. think like he basically, came back and yeah you know, had one of the most legendary careers of all time. It's crazy to think like yeah, wow, the guy's been struck by lightning. I had a plane crash. I mean, yeah. crazy. And John Valentine, I talked to him and he told me, he said, Dave, understand that John and I were the last two people they took out of the plane. Uh, and John said that, he said, be glad you don't remember because the smell of fuel, uh, he, didn't realize his back was broken the way it was. He thought his feet were uh, pinned underneath, you know, and they were going to have to cut, cut him out somehow. But it, uh, then he realized, you know, as they were taking him out that his back was broken. So, but he said, yeah, be happy. You don't remember. Wow. Yeah. Was it some sort of, was it like weather related though? or no, was it no, was, it was, it was he ran out of gas. Wow. And you're supposed to have 30 minutes or 45 minutes extra fuel. No, he ran out of gas. He, because he had too much weight on the plane, you know, this is all the report now that he had too much weight on the plane. And so he dumped fuel, did not put enough fuel on, and, and he ran out. But, the report also says, uh, and he switched the wing tanks, I think, or I don't know, but somewhere there was 10 gallons, whether it was the main or the wing, and if he had switched to one of those, he would have made it. You know, but, you know, I always wonder, I, you know, that I really shouldn't be here, you know, but I am. So uh, the man up there, I feel still has something for me to do. Uh, maybe it's this. I, you know, maybe some supposed to win the lottery. 
<laughs> could be, could be. Yeah, I know that, you know, uh, after WCW, I volunteered for Red Cross for 18 years on national disasters as part of it. Uh, so I did that and uh, I had a great time doing that. Believe it or not, I love chaos. Yeah. I said, this, this reminds me of a TV show. You know, people going around, you know, especially in the offices and so forth. That crazy chaos of pro wrestling got you ready for oh, yeah. American Red Cross. That's right. I always loved it until the politicians got there. And then I said, all right, you know, uh, you know, it's time to go. I was a disaster assessment manager, government liaison, which I didn't jump up and down about. Uh, and then in information dissemination, which uh, we take all that information coming in and put it into a sit rep and so forth uh, to distribute to the uh, different Red Cross people. And I was also a mapper, a GIS mapper. So I, I definitely enjoyed that. So, but COVID hit and uh, I figured it was time to back away. Now, just to rewind back to Crockett promote or Jim Crockett promotions, JCP. Yeah. Why the your brother gets to be in charge of Jim Crockett promotions when your father passes? How come it wasn't you or or you know maybe Francis or why why Jim? Well, all right. First, Francis was not in quote the business. Her husband was. Oh, John, right? John. He was when after Dad passed away. He was the president of the company, but then. Uh, the thing is, I guess he didn't know any better. You know, he started having this affair, which, come on, I, how stupid is that? You know, especially, you know, when you're dealing with the, the Crockett company. So he would, he was asked to leave. And so he left. And so, you know, my mother said, Jimmy. And I said, okay. So that was it. You know, she was still alive and, you know, she, her word was law. Did you agree with it? Do you, you're okay sure. With it? Sure. You know, I, you know, I'm a reluctant leader in that I will lead if I have to, but I'd rather be behind the scenes making things work than actually being out there. Uh, I think someone uh, called me at one time a battlefield general. I'd like to be out there. We, we know the plan. You know, it's your job to manipulate it however it is just to get it done. And so I enjoyed that. Uh, uh, at one time, I guess later on, you know, I, I felt – I probably should have been the uh, person to lead the company later on uh, in that personally, I wasn't ready for it. You know, that, uh, you know, I was, Jimmy was more, uh, there again, I was the last one that, that came into the company. So as far as, my father mentoring, uh, he, he was Jimmy. Jackie was crazy man. Yeah, you know, he, <laughs> he was just you know, Jackie's Jackie. Yeah, you know, yeah, you know, great. He was the best cameraman out there. He would take a hit to get the shot. You know, I really uh, none better, but uh. Yeah, Jimmy was that way, but I, you know, it. Uh, I know that I'm going to go forward a little bit. When Turner, when we got into our mess, our fix, that we outran our money. We had plenty of money sitting in receivables, time sales. Uh, but, you know, everybody's slow pay, you know, God forbid, you know, 90 days, 180 days. Uh, and we were just out running that, you know, that money and 
Ted Turner, you know, saw an opportunity. I can't blame him. And he said, uh, either you sell to me or I'll kick you off our station. And I can stand it longer than you can. Uh, but I still did not want to go to Turner. Rick Flair did not want to go to Turner. And Rick said, David, if you, I'm, I'll stay with you, whatever you want to do. And I was going to take uh, the company into Chapter 11 and start with whomever we had, a territory again, or whatever you want to call it. And our other uh, TV stations, we were syndicating shows to 82 TV stations. So I had a TV truck. You know, I had all that, the the editing and, you know, so we could we could get by with that. You know, we could get by and create. A, we just wouldn't have TBS, you know, that, uh, you know, I figured. And uh, the governor of North Carolina called and he said we'd help. You know, he'd help in any way. Jim Babb, who was president of Jefferson Pilot Broadcasting. Now, see, that is what I was going to do. He wanted to be partners. Jefferson Productions, which was in huge, you know, as far as sports, the ACC, uh, uh, NFL, as far as their broadcasting trucks and crews and so forth. Uh, so that would have been perfect. But our my mother, uh, she said, David, sign the document. And some people think, you're crazy. You know, you know, I have that much respect for my mother because my mother and father got us to the point, you know, that, you know, that we were huge and, uh, to say no, you know, that I couldn't do that. So I went kicking and screaming, but, Think about this. I was, I and Jackie and I uh, was the only one that really survived, you know, uh, at Turner, you know, I became vice president, you know, of production. Uh, so, uh, you know, and Jackie was the cameraman. You know, Jimmy, they asked to leave. Francis, they asked to leave. I was only supposed to be there five years as a, and just a consultant. Then they asked me to stay on. So I ended up, I think, 15 years until AOL bought Turner. And they didn't like us. Matter of fact, nobody liked us at Turner. When Ted, I guess, I guess I'm jumping forward. I hope you don't mind. Yeah. That when Ted bought us, you know, he, he, he had a great, he's a great visionary. And, but nobody, nobody at Turner you know, his boiler director, directors, nobody wanted us. Even though we had the highest rated shows on his station, they, in some ways, they hated our guts. And Ted would always throw us up to them saying, look at wrestling. They get all these ratings, number one in their time period. They don't cost, cost this much. Why can't you do this, Braves? You know, and so forth, and just bang away at him. Uh, and finally, Jack Petrick was the first board direct person on the board that took us over. Uh, and then he eventually left. Jim Hurd, he left. Bob Dew, he left. Then you had, you know, the Bill Watts, the Dusty Rhodes, Kevin Sullivan, Kip Allen Fry. Yeah. Alan, oh, yeah. Yeah. And he was, I think Kip was accounting or something uh there uh yeah. he wanted to do a, a three corner ring hmm. yeah hmm. i just saw that last weekend they did a three corner ring uh boxing match yeah try, try it that's weird but okay. yeah it, it, yeah. It, it's it's yeah it is weird i you know that it doesn't give your opponent much room to move and and a three quarter ring would make it it's too condensed really for wrestling to, to get any 
uh, flying moves in, I guess you might say. Uh, but yeah, eh, you know. And then, you know, a lot of that crazy stuff we did uh, at Turner, Jim Hurd said, me, you know, David, I can't control the wrestlers, but I can control how we present them. So that's when we started doing all the, the pyrotechnics and trying to lights like vents and uh, so forth. And I never had a budget. It's just do it, you know, which, you know, it, it was, that's hard to get used to. What did you think at the end with that? Well, obviously we'll go back, but just WCW, just to touch on that. So Jamie Kellner is in charge. He sells it for basically four or $5 million to WWF. Bischoff yeah. put an offer on there with Fusion Media Ventures for $65 million. Kellner doesn't get fired for making possibly the dumbest move ever. You know, if you're like a real executive, wouldn't you be like, wait a second, you just lost $60 million on a deal? Oh, but we don't want them on our stations. Okay, but it's still $60 million more dollars. What what like what happened there? I know Brad Siegel obviously got involved, and right. Stu, supposedly Stu Snyder on the other end, who was Brad yeah. Siegel's college roommate, got involved in WWF's end, and he only worked for WWF for so amount of yay amount of time. So what what happened there? What what, what was really the the downfall and the sale? Because it seemed like Bischoff had a pretty damn good offer on there on the table. Right, and uh, also uh, had uh, Paul Beckham. Paul Beckham was uh, at one point chief financial officer at Turner and Bill Shaw. I talked to Bill about buying, you know, buying WCW and uh, Bill came back and he said, David, you know, all they want to do is get rid of you. You know, that, you know, the, the deal with Vince, you know, and it's, and it was not so much money. It was, they were buying advertising. You know, and they kept on saying it was $40 million, and, you know, $40 million. And two, a lot of that is our own fault. All right. I, two years before that, I kept on telling, God, hey, you're killing the golden goose. And at one point, we had $18 million worth of wrestlers that were out because of injuries. You know, they were ruling the roost. They, uh, you know, uh, drugs were rampant. Uh, it just, it wasn't good. You know, that we did our best at WCW uh, before the Time Warner sale when Bill Shaw took us over. Uh, and Bill Shaw was head of HR. He was the only person on the Turner board. He finally said, and he was an original. Turner person. And he said, I will take them. And he was fantastic as far as uh, how he managed. He let us take ownership in, in what we were doing. Uh, and uh, that, so it was not ruled by committee. It was, all right, you've got this project, do it. And he, matter of fact, I I made a pitch, you know, uh, to Bill about, you know, being the, I guess, the executive vice president. And, and he told me, he said, David, I cannot let a Crockett be there. I cannot do it. He said, but I'm going to hire th this young man. He said, Eric Bischoff. You know, I, I feel that uh, he will be good. And I want you to guard his back and to help him in every way. And so that's what I did. Every week I'd have lunch with Bill and, you know, we talk things and he said, you know, how's it going? I said, he's learning. He's learning. And a lot of times Eric would go over to Jocks and Jill's and, and just say, you know, I, I can't do this. I can't do this. And yes, you can. Yes, you can. And then, Look at him now. <laughs> you know, yeah. very confident, very confident. But then, you know, Time Warner, and then it started being ruled by committee. Uh, and then you had uh, Harvey Schiller, right? 
he came in and yep. he didn't, you know, that's wrestling was the last thing he wanted to deal with. So then it ended up all the crazies are running the store again. And that started to be the downfall, you know, because with Bill and we did it uh, under his guidance, we made a profit and we started taking things back from the different divisions as far as syndication and sales and so forth. And, and we had people in the office that, that did that. And, it, and it started clicking. We started clicking and then it, uh, Eric was terminated. There was a, and I wasn't there. I was on vacation and it was uh, Sharon Sodello and uh, I think Gary Chester. There was a group part of it to, to get Eric out, which I think was a mistake in some ways. I, I know it was a mistake, you know, that, uh, you know, Bill had a pretty good leash on, on Eric. You know, he would work with him, you know, every week, you know, about doing this, doing that, asking questions. Uh, but then it just, you know, they got tired of us. You know, and we were doing some stupid things, too. You know, the, even to ourselves, you know, that, you know, I, I ended up traveling, I think, four tractor trailers and a lot, maybe two of them were would carry just stuff because they would never let me know what was going to happen. You know, so I ended up trying to anticipate what was going to happen. So that raised the cost. I know at one time we were in Canada and they wanted an ambulance. Well, the ambulance service would not do that. So I ended up buying an ambulance. You know, so what'd you do with the ambulance? Nothing. You know, I used it. You know, so I basically gave it back to the the company that I sold it from and bought it from. Wow. Right. You did you did that that stuff. You know, we finally need had to have a an accountant come with us to sign checks just to pay for things. And you know, I got tired of using my credit card. You know, even though it was a corporate card, still, you know, some some people, uh, matter of fact, I had to turn our plane with that one time to pick somebody up from out in Oklahoma. It's crazy to think like, okay, 83 weeks of dominance, which if you really delve into it was like more like 90 weeks, then you delve mm -hmm. into it even further. It was really 104 weeks out of like 120, basically two straight years of absolute dominance. But it's crazy right. to think of ultimate high to the ultimate low and the sale to Vince. I mean, it's surreal to think about that. It was. And during that time of the ultimate high, it was that we were all working for that goal of beating, beating, you know, Vince every week. You know, it was, we were all, you know, next day, what's the rating? What's the rating? You know, all right, what can we do? You know, it was a team effort. And I mean, everyone, everyone that was on the crew, you know, we were all just giddy uh, when, you know, we, we got the ratings and everybody would continue. Everybody would work hard you know, in the truck, the lighting crew, the pyrotechnic crew, the sound crew, uh, cameramen, you know, uh, all the TV guys, all the post-production and pre-production, you know, everybody was working for one thing, and that's to be number one. And I talk to Kevin Sullivan all the time. We always kind of dissect, ah, like, like what I love Kevin. Wrong. I love oh, he's, Kevin. He's the best. He's enough, but it's so funny. It's like, what went wrong here? What went wrong there? Sometimes he says it's creative control, brother, and he throws that out there and stuff like that. And you know, little chinks in the armor along the way, creatively, yeah. definitely didn't help either. No, and we stopped working together. You know that. They got paranoid for some reason about the dirt sheets getting, you know, what we were going to do on TV. And so, you know, everybody was pointing the finger at everybody. I said, who gives a damn about the dirt sheets? I mean, how many people read it? You know, if, if you look at your TV ratings, I guarantee you only 1% of the rating, yep. maybe not even that, reads the dirt sheets, you know. We have to concentrate on 
you know, television ratings. You know, so, but they just became paranoid. So what was your role, though? Like, specifically, you? so you're just a producer or executive no. producer? Like, what's the title when you were with <laughs> WCW? Well, I was uh, vice president of television production. Uh, at first, I wasn't. When Eric came in, uh, he made me vice president of television production. Uh, you know, when I, I st strange, I wasn't supposed to be there, really. I had a consulting agreement, right? You know, five year consulting agreement. After that, you know, it was goodbye. But during that time, I would, you know, go down there, stay at the Omni Hotel or the Marriott at the airport or the Marriott over on 75 near Marietta uh, and go to the office and just sort of be around and just do things, you know, that uh, it was, you know, television. This was new to some people. It wasn't to others and just help out. And matter of fact, the first time I met, Eric, it was in Texas, uh, not Pondre Island. Uh, well, but it was in a, a, a town in Texas. He was, it was, he was brand new coming in for the 900 line. And I was, we were placing cameras and lighting and sound and, you know, I was doing this and he comes over and I, and I, I said, Go stand over there until I get finished, you know. And so that's, you know, that's my meeting of Eric. <laughs> <laughs> he's probably, I remember this guy. He, uh, yeah, know, he's bossing me around. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when you're like doing the production stuff, when actually Hogan comes in, we'll just kind of just go there right, for just that a second. Eric, Eric, and, and uh, Jim Bat, not Jim Bat. Um, All right, go ahead. Uh, Bill, Bill Shaw. Shaw. Yeah, Bill, Bill, Bill said, you know, Eric mentioned Bill, and Bill said that will put us uh, on the map. Did you agree? With, did you think so, too? I mean, now you got the biggest star of all time answering the fray. Well, you know, I it wasn't me thinking about, I was thinking about the money he was asking for. You know, but when Bill said it was, you know, it would, he is the number one, person in the world when you say wrestling who do they think about hulk yeah hulk hogan so that instantly puts you on the platform so that's what we did yeah and then uh, after that you know you had kevin nash and scott hall come you know and it it's started rolling definitely Wrestling wasn't dead or in the doldrums, but it was definitely very low, especially from 80s to the early 90s when it was so high. You get to that mid-90s point, even Hulk, Hulkamania was kind of here, and all of a sudden the NWO hits, and it skyrockets. Literally saved the business and brought it back. So Hogan really is kind of credited for the 80s run and this run, which eventually launches Attitude Era and Steve Austin too, but it wouldn't have ever started or no one would have noticed had Hogan and the NWO not have been you know, a part of that. Well, like right. know, as far as production wise, did you do a lot of that backstage NWO stuff, black and white, nitty gritty stuff? Oh, well, we did it. You know, I should say the production crew did it. You know, I, you know, television, uh, that was getting to the point that that started some of the, uh, we weren't, didn't work together. You know, now Eric, it just, I don't know why, uh, you know, you know, I, I love the gimmick, you know, and I think we personally, I, I think we didn't take advantage of it as much as we could have as far as marketing. You know, uh, you, you know, you look at that black leather jacket behind me, you know, that yes. we could have been, you know, we were, we didn't mass produce t-shirts. We, we would FedEx them to, Japan, you know, we, you know, it, you know, you even had the Japanese portion of the NWO, you know, in Japan, and they were crazy about it. 
Yeah. Oh so, yeah. You know, uh, I, you know, we had, uh, uh, well, you know, Craig Leathers uh, did a lot with that. You know, uh, Keith Mitchell did quite a lot. You know, you look at Keith now with the uh, AEW. You know, the, there are a lot of people over there right now that were working with WCW. Yeah. Uh, Neil Pruitt, of course. Yeah. Now, Neil, he did a lot. You know, he was the voice yeah. of the NWO. Now, he can definitely tell you the inner workings of, you know, because he did quite a few of those uh, videos, the NWO videos. You know, he because we, you know, were working on the arena show, the event side, and uh, he would do all that uh, production. And it was, you know, some of it he could do in advance. Others they would do it that day and crank it out. And it's fantastic work, really. It's crazy to think, though, with the NWO, like you said, like merchand merchandising, marketing and stuff could have been more. WBF is like two floors in the building, creative services, and then the marketing licensing department dedicated to that. You guys supposedly, as Kevin Nash infamously said, infamously said, he goes, two employees in one corner of a building. Like He's like, we should have had what WWF had with that kind of structure. Right. But there again, uh, it's like 2020, right? Uh you know, I just, I, I go and look at those t-shirts that I have, I found, you know, yes, marketing those, those things that night, you know, a lot of those t-shirts are crude t-shirts that we had. They were not really for sale at that time. They were just t-shirts that our camera crew and, you know, the, the staff were wearing to denote us from a spectator. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, there's, yeah, we learned. I remember when I got the first NWO shirt, the like first, first one, it wasn't black and white. It was like black and, and gray and didn't say New World Order, just said NWO. I was like, wow, this is, mm -hmm. it was almost like they rushed it out. I mean, as soon as we got that that packet, that little uh, flyer with the NWO, we, we bought it right. immediately. But I was like, wow, that's interesting. They didn't really, you know, almost like rush job on the shirts. And then they turned it into the black and white with the new world order. And it was a rush job. Yeah, it was. Do you yeah, think, it was, it was, it was just boom. Do you think that it just in essence though, it does save the business. Hogan turns heel. I mean, it just creates this huge boom. I mean, it had so, so much eyes on you. Was it almost too much too soon for you guys? Do you think? No, I, when I say no, Too much too soon. Good it's question. It's almost like you're you're like flat, and then all of a sudden it's like okay, to the moon. You have ninety weeks or eighty three weeks in a row of ninety weeks to the moon. But we we I know that production wise we were we were cranking it out. You know the uh, if you're talking about the marketing end of it, uh, we we. We didn't take advantage of it. We, in a lot of ways, didn't have the people to do that, uh, which we definitely should have. And, and you know, it's uh, that's one of the problems with Turner at that time, the Turner system family, as you, you had marketing, you have the two floors of marketing, but they want to market the Cartoon Network and TNT and... Turner, uh, classic movies, the Braves, NBA, uh, basketball, and anything else but wrestling. Whereas they should should have taken advantage of it. You know, I've got a T-shirt around here, and it's it's upstairs, and it's has some of the Cartoon Network characters in the nwo you know in other words the oh, cool uh, yeah. yeah it's and so like space ghost is wearing an nwo shirt or something yeah, yeah and uh the some 
Brutus somebody, I forget. But yeah, where no the yeah the, the cartoon characters were wearing it and then it, and it had the NWO on it and yeah that's that's a classic shirt and and you know I think it's I don't remember anyone else having one I, you know I don't exactly remember how I got it but I did it yeah it's pretty rare yeah, it is it is and I guess I sh instead of wearing it I should uh, frame it. Yeah, I actually have a Hogan cut sleeve, cut in the back, um, like Terminator Hollywood Hogan shirt, mm -hmm. where he's got an arm like that. I I think that's pretty damn rare because I don't remember them like mass producing that either. But it's a yeah. very cool shirt. It's almost like he would, you know, the one he would just rip in the ring. It was kind of had right. like, tears and stuff in it. Very cool. Mm -hmm. But they should have mass produced that. I know a million people would have bought that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's a shame. It's a shame. Uh, and I'm just thinking. I wonder if. The company that used to produce our shirts, I wonder if they still have the stencil. Oh, yeah. yeah. The guy, Wes Benton. I need to see if I can run him down. Yeah. See, yeah. That there would be go. something. Uh, right. To start printing those things again. again. I wonder if we'd run into any copyrights or anything. I doubt it. Yeah. I doubt, you know, because, hmm, I'm going to check on that. Yeah. I know WB. I'm glad you brought sold. it up. Yeah, check on that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I know WB still sells NWO merchandise to this day, and it supposedly sells pretty well. Wow. Okay. Which is crazy because I I was watching wrestling the other night. I saw people with NWO shirts. I was like, oh my god. You know, I did too. I, you know, every now and then I turn and I went, how'd they get that? Right. Yeah. I saw the Kardashians were wearing an NWO. They probably have no idea what it is, but they were wearing <laughs> NWO stuff. I was like, what that? What in, in 2021 they were an NWO? I was like, that's yeah. pretty cool. All right. Yeah. It is. Lasting impact of the NWO right there. Mm -hmm. One of the best selling shirts ever, even though they could have probably sold even more. Oh, yeah. It re really was. And, and you know, why didn't they crank them out? Why didn't they just? Oh, well. Who knows, right? Who knows? I want to go back to NWA for a second because right. I know we were talking a little bit off air. I was so enthralled with them when my sister's friend kind of, I mean, I'm, I'm like six years old at this point, but he's like, this is the real stuff. And he's showing me because I'm, you know, I'm a Hogan fan and I'm loving the Hulkster. Um, my dad's selling insurance in New Jersey to Pedro Morales. So I'm kind of more WWF right. guy. Yeah. So, so I'm like, okay, you know, that's, that's cool. And then all of a sudden he shows me this. I'm like, oh my God, they're bleeding like crazy. And Dusty, this guy is real and, and flyer and stuff. So what, like what, what encapsulated NWA at that point? Because that roster, when you look at that roster, especially in the eighties, Oh my God, jeez! Oh, and, right. and literally, you pick Nikita out of nowhere. It's like, who is this monster? I mean, it's just insane. The Horseman, Dusty, Magnum, Nikita, <sighs> Ivan is even there. I mean, right. What a, what a roster. Tully Blanchard. Yep. You know, uh, Arn Anderson. Uh, it just goes on and on. And uh, it started with George Scott. He was the booker. He brought in uh, Johnny Valentine. And uh, it just, and Wahoo, and that just sort of started bringing others. Uh, Baron Von Rotschke, you know, he came in. Uh, you had the Destroyer. Uh, you had, uh, who else? Uh, Rip Hawk, Sweet Hanson. Bunch of uh, well, they were, they were with Lord us later. before. Yeah, they, oh. yeah, and eventually they sort of, uh, they were getting up in age. You yeah. get up in age, you know, with that. Uh, Minnesota Wrecking Crew. Oh, yes. Well, you know, they, they were going in and out because uh, Ole eventually at that time went to Atlanta, become the booker, you know, uh, down there. and But go back and forth. He eventually bought a, a house down there and, you know, was there. But Gene always stayed in Charlotte. When you but, guys start, start to ramp it up, though, yeah, like, is that George Scott kind of thing, or is that George? Gene, George and well, George and then Dusty started. You know, uh, it was you know the, Dusty came in and was doing the the sort of the creative. Uh, I call it big show. You know the. Uh, so like you know being the hulk hogan or 
the Randy Savage with the plumes and so forth. Uh, and more show, more show to it, you know, and so that, that wasn't George. George was, you know, George was more wrestling. You know, then we started doing more videos uh, outside of the program, you know, with uh, we go to Florida and, and uh, go out and produce these things out side at night with the fire and the cowboy, you know, Dusty come riding up and, you know, sort of Magnum be with him and, and create that. But it just, it's Roddy Piper. He came in, you know, just things just started clicking people. It, you know, how did it happen? Right place, right time. In a lot of ways, you know, who, you know, Wahoo, wrestled you know in florida texas mid-south uh up north never really came for us george got him to come in why he never came for us i don't know you know that so but uh george scott you know definitely started it and uh, uh it it this the word got out you know arn anderson came because of rick Rick saw Iron at Mid South, and uh, he came back and said, uh, "I have a tape of of another Anderson," and it was Iron on the beach cutting a promo, and we oh yes, and then Steamboat, you know, Rick was wrestling out. He saw Steamboat in Atlanta. He said, came back and said, "I can do something with this guy," and he did, you know, and then well what. Sting, Sting came to us. Uh, let me, yeah, Sting came to us with Mid South, which was a bad deal. Not Sting, but Mid South. You know, we did not do our due diligence with that, and there was a lot of commitments that were made by Mid South bills that uh, it, and we split. Our business. We had a Texas office and Charlotte office, and that didn't work. Did not work. Period. You guys were stuck with their basically their losses. Yeah, stuck with their losses. Heavy. Why did Heavy. you guys do that deal? Did you think that okay, we got to compete? Why did you do the deal though? Is it just to compete with Vince? I didn't want to. Uh, Jimmy did. Uh, uh, he thought that Vince was going to buy it. I said, Vince is not going to buy it. Why well, buy something that's going bankrupt? You know, that just wait and pick up pieces. But, yeah, it was. Uh, he, Jimmy just felt that, you know, oh, Vince is going to get it and that, you know, we need this area. And, and two, I don't know this for sure, but I, 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 you know, that Jimmy was newly married. Uh, Dusty wanted to go home to Texas. This, uh, this gave them a perfect opportunity to do that. You know, and, uh, it, but it was wrong. You know, that we ended up getting an airplane end up buying two airplanes always yeah. hear that's st those stories from the guys how much money did that cost well the g1 was a 16 passenger plane that actually in some cases made sense it was a you figured a 500 mile range we would take the wrestlers drop them off let's say in cincinnati okay and they would wrestle around that area and we'd have towns book a group of 16, let's say uh, there's 17 count up the ref and they would do their thing. And then we'd take another group, drop them off. Uh, and um, somewhere in mid South drop them there. And then another group here. So, and then you'd go back after that week, pick them up, 
you know, you'd bring them to Charlotte for X number of days. So they wash it close, something that gone again. Same thing with the other. And 500 mile range, it was turbo prop. It would, you know, it would haul. The Falcon 20 made no sense whatsoever. If anything, all it did was cause people to be jealous. Well, I'm not flying on the plane. Why can't I fly on the plane? Right. Right. You know, uh, what do you think I am? Chopped liver? You know, that made no sense. And that was at that time, that's also uh, when it really started hitting the fan as far as uh, outrunning the money. Just too expensive, and, right? Pardon? Those planes, those planes got to be pretty expensive. Oh, yeah. 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 Planes, pilots. Uh, yeah. It, but the, the, the only one, I didn't like the G1 either. Uh, but I could, in my mind, justify it because it helped us expand without paying airplane tickets, you know, uh, passenger service. Uh, we could haul their all their bags and whatever it is uh, to, you know, and that worked in a lot of ways. Uh, you know, to just use it to fly to Atlanta for TV? No. No. Drive. You know, it's not that far. You know, it's Saturday morning, you know, that, well, you know, I take that back. You know, it, a lot of the Saturday mornings we would bring them in to Atlanta and then they would fly out, you know, to X, X, Y, Z, you know, instead of putting them on a, a Delta or American flight or at that time, Eastern. Yeah. And some of that made sense. Planes? Pardon? Whose idea was the planes? Was that Jimmy or Dusty or both? Uh, Jimmy was the G1. Uh, the, the Falcon 20, the name was Stardust. Hmm. Definitely dusty. That's all I got to say. <laughs> 100% dusty. Okay. Yep. I, no, I don't know that. Okay. I just know on the plane said Stardust. Who actually brought Dusty in to begin with? Is that like Jimmy? Ed, Jimmy did. Is that because of Eddie Graham or is that because he's somebody like recommended Dusty as far as coming in and booking? Eddie. Eddie. Um, Eddie Graham. You know, at that time, too, uh, they, Eddie hadn't passed away yet. The, but then once Eddie passed away, then there was a lot of flux down there. And you had yeah. so many owners, too, of, of Florida. Uh, are you getting a little pixelation there? Or is that your, is that me or you? Um. I'm good here. I don't know. Maybe, maybe it might be me. I'm not sure. Okay. Must be me. All right. So, but that, you know, and Jimmy and Dusty hit it off, you know, which, uh, and we also, you, you got to remember too, that we ran this like our father ran the company. He was the dictator. He was the person. You know, you can't have two people telling people what to do. It just doesn't work. You know, that, you know, you just can't. And sometimes I guess I'd get my point across. It'd, it'd get to the point that, you know, you know, as a, a family, you know, you are brothers you go out back and take care of it. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. So was but, it, was it okay though? Like with you, like, okay, we're going to bring Dusty in. Like everybody's in agreement, or that's Jimmy's in charge. Jimmy said, Dusty's coming in. Dusty's coming in. Well, Dusty didn't come in, come in. It was Dusty came in as far as, uh, for the big shows in Greensboro. He was not really in the office. Uh, he was, uh, he, He'd be there for, for really for big shows, uh, doing certain things uh, with Jimmy. He had he he was working angles uh, for that, 
you know, that we had a lot of different people come in. I mean, we had Harley Race come in. We had the Fox, you know, that uh, it, and Dusty was around then. But Dusty, he's a creative guy. You know, I think, uh, you know, he, he had his ways. I wish I could have read him a little better than, you know, than I did. Uh, that, you know, you have to talk to him and, and see where his head's going, you know, because once it's there, you've got to catch up. And that, that didn't work a lot of times. So. So he's big picture guy, obviously. He's creating yes, right. Starcade and War Games. I mean, all these mm -hmm. things that really, you know, cement you guys putting you on the map, but it also isn't cheap producing this stuff. That's right. right. Yeah, it's like spin the wheel, make the deal. Yeah, I, I, I asked him, all right, what movie did you see for that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, and uh, what was the other one? Uh, uh, the one John Wayne uh, with the patch. Over his eye, uh, um, you know, which uh, I'm, is it true grit or uh, McClinton? Yeah, or yeah we had a pay, -per -view, a pay per view true grit, you know, and then you know, uh, war games. No, war games was war games. I don't know where that came from, but that that worked out well. Part of that uh, is a uh, Mad Max, the match beyond member of the cage ah, and stuff, yeah, right? Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah, he gets a lot of stuff from the movies. I forget, yeah. Starcade is, is from a movie too, yeah, yeah, and. You know, so when I finally realized that they're movies, I said, I, I, I jokingly always say, all right, what movie are you watching today? <laughs> he was definitely a John Wayne fan. That's for sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And some of that stuff, you know, they they wanted it so fast. It, it wasn't I, I couldn't do it correctly the way I wanted to do it, you know, as far as like we did that three tier cage match yep oh. so luckily somebody didn't get hurt you know that uh, i you know i didn't want it the way it was but that's the only thing we could do in the amount of time that we had you know in the building see too you gotta remember you know you go in a building and you you have a midnight move in and you've got to be ready, you know, doors open at six. So you don't have long, you know, uh, every now and then, you know, I would get a day before move in, you know, if I could, you know, I was not there again. Uh, when I was booking as far as the when it was Jim Crockett promotions and I was booking the towns, you know, I would, you know, I'd want a day to move in, at least, a, you know, a half day uh, to move in before the, you know, because it just made perfectly good sense. We were not like a rock show that has been doing it so long, they just know. Everything we did was a learning curve, you know, that we didn't have our own stage hands. We didn't have our own lighting crew or sound. It was always someone new. Yeah. And that's an extra cost too, right? I mean, every time <laughs> of course. you're doing that extra yeah. cost here, there, and there. Yeah. 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 And, and those triple cages were never good either. I mean, they look great, no. but the match is itself terrible. No. Yeah. Right. Right. It just, you know, because there again, the guys, they look at it and go, oh, shit. You know. <laughs> You know, and, and they didn't have time to work with it, to understand it. It was a learning curve for them, too. They go into it for the first time. So, yeah, it's regular cage match, okay. Yep. Yeah. But uh, the others, no, that was, yeah, no. So with Dusty, we're saying, you know, big picture guy. Do you think he was a creative genius? Like, what, like, what are your thoughts on Dusty as far as creative-wise? You're asking me a loaded question, aren't you? Yes, they're very loaded. <laughs> they're very, very loaded. Yeah, it is. It is. It is. <laughs> I think Dusty was creative. Yes. Now what? <laughs> and and yes. Good, good, bad, and different. Obviously, 
I mean, there's there's some ups and some downs with those. Yes, ups and downs. You know that no one can be creative all the time. You know that you're going to hit some duds, right? You've got you, there's no way. Uh, you know, I'm not making excuses for him. You know that uh, you when you hire someone, you expect them to do 100 percent every single day, 20 24 seven. Uh, but we are are human, and it doesn't work that way. So, yes, he had some duds. Oh, yes, that he did. Uh, and they were pretty big duds, but he had some winners, too. So I, I have a lot of respect for Dusty, you know, that he was willing to, I guess, put his name forward or put himself forward to do it. Uh and, you know, and Jimmy gave him uh, the chance to do it, and he took off. I, you know, then I think if I had to do it all over again, I, I, would, uh, I would explain to both of them about profit and loss that, yeah, you can do this. Uh, right. You'll be paid on net, not gross. That will wake anybody up. You know, you can't spend two million dollars to make a million dollars. That I mean, because you won't make it. You know, There's no ROI there. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Now, very friendly with JJ Dillon, he would always say that you know he's a Dusty's assistant Booker. So, mm -hmm. and he's good friends with Rick. Obviously, I mean that goes. Oh, yeah. With that, I mean that goes without even saying. But mm -hmm. so Rick goes to him, and it's like, okay, Dusty and Rick, and Dusty and the Horseman are having this big feud. R Rick's like. We're getting beat a lot. We're getting beat up every night. I want to keep my heat. I want to keep my thing. So he was almost like the liaison between uh, Jimmy and Rick and then Dusty in the middle. And he's trying to like, I don't know, like trying to, you know, play, not play both sides, but he's trying to almost like be defensive for everybody. Like, oh no, you know, maybe smooth things over in certain ways. Did you play both up? sides? No, I yeah. like that. Yeah. He, you know, uh, JJ with his relationships with Dusty. Yeah, uh, you know that the door was always open to him. The Rick, yes, uh, you know that. In some ways, you know they they could get beat, but after they get beat, they glom the winner, so to speak. You know, yeah, okay, Dusty won, but he's laying in the ring all bloodied, and and you know they're going to have to get the ambulance to pick him up. So they're still throwing cans and rocks at them, right? So, you know, it's all in the way you're beaten, uh, you know, and, and it's the egos. Come on. You know, you, Rick, Dusty. Yep. Oh, there's not enough room in the world, you know, for the ego. Uh, and rightfully so. Pretty epic feud between those two, both behind the scenes and obviously in front of the camera. I mean, two of oh. them great, but it seems like they would be, you know, battling behind the scenes too, which a lot of people probably weren't aware of. That is true. I think behind the scenes was better than in front of the camera. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> you seen some blow ups between them? Uh, not blow ups. See, that, that, you know, they. Don't get they did not get in arguments in front of other wrestlers per se. That 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 did not happen. You know, it's just you know, it's them voicing their opinions to everybody else. And you know, and then you know, we've got our little uh, what rats that run and say, You should have heard what Dusty said about Rick. You know, or oh, you should have heard what Rick said about Dusty. <laughs> right. Yeah, but Dusty knew Rick was the cash cow, right? I mean, he knew he oh, was a, yeah. a draw, right? But you know, Dusty wanted to beat him. Yeah, and Rick wanted to beat Dusty. That's sort of like Dusty wanted to beat Hogan. Yeah, you know? and Hogan wants to beat Dusty. Hogan wants to beat Flair. Flair wants to beat Hogan. You know, it's yeah. The the top guys want to beat top guys. They want you know they want to be the man, the person that everybody pays attention to. They want to be the person you want the autograph from. Got any good Nate stories? I know you probably have a ton. Oh golly, 
Uh, well, it's all, you know, Nate, I know we were in Baltimore quite a lot. And the four horsemen, they would get on, you know, the TBS show in the mornings. We would tape it there at uh, Turner. And they'd be promoting where they were going to have their party afterwards, you know, at the, whether it was the Omni or the Hilton or the Marriott and Rick could have a suite and, you know, all you girls, here we come. And, and they, they would have a party. They would have a party. And, you know, Rick, and we've seen with, I think, a, a, a lawsuit or two about Rick likes to uh, put on his robe and his belt and nothing else. Mm. And, uh, you know, it's, it's happened more than not. And so he would do that, uh, at the party and come up behind some unexpected female sitting on a couch and take his Johnson, hit her on the head with it. You know, <laughs> he would do that. I know that we flew after television. Uh, to Hawaii from Atlanta, nonstop. We drank every bit of alcohol on the plane. Even all the cordials, Rick would pour them in this pitcher, then go around and pour them. And of course, he did that. He went into the bathroom and came out in his robe and belt. And, you know, and the flight attendants on that flight sort of, you know, taken with him because the they were staying at the same hotel. And and uh, when I had to catch the plane back, Rick was staying there because they had a match. And I had to find Jimmy because he's supposed to, well, you know, that time Jimmy wasn't married and ended up found him. He was in Rick's room uh, with the girl and, and, and Jimmy was there. He was. Jimmy goes sucking toes or something, but, oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. And Rick's bar bill, you know, $1,200 at least, uh, constantly, uh, you know, at one time you could, you know, before the bar closed, you could buy drinks. Ex right. you know. Yep. So, and Rick loved kamikazes and I, I've seen him where he would buy, a hundred kamikazes. Oh, you know, so before the bar closed, so they can have them on the bar and drink them. And I mean, they don't sip them, they chug them. And it just, this wild times. Who's paying that bar bill? He did. Wow. Yeah. A lot of they and see, you know, Rick is Rick. Rick Flair lived his gimmick. And, and in a lot of ways, even he does that today. But back then, he was Ric Flair, the 60-minute man, wheeling, dealing, uh, his clothes, cars, drink. Oh, and, but there were a lot of parasites, as I call it. That's why he would spend so much. You know, he just wanted people around him. And uh, they would come and, yeah, Rick, buy me a drink. And, you know, yeah, I'll take a bottle of that Don Perry on, you know. It, and Rick just, yeah, and then he gets the bar bill and he pays it or, you know, it just. And I said, Rick, let somebody else pay you. Yeah. Let somebody buy you a drink. Yeah. Yeah. But he, yeah, you know, must be crazy. Oh, crazy. If you talk to him some, ask him about his bar bills. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk to him about it. Yeah. That. yeah. Uh, they say that the now, now it's out there all over the place because of um, the recent documentary, but they're saying he does the helicopter trick. It's like, you know what I mean? He get, takes off the robe, he starts swimming yeah, around. Got, wait a minute. The helicopter with the, you lost me. With, you know, his nether regions, he spins it around like a helicopter. <laughs> Oh, yes. Well, yeah, he spins around it. Whack. Yeah, it's, uh, it's his club. Yeah. Yeah. 
So I guess these stories are true about Nietzsche oh, for the yes. most part. Yes, yes, yeah. He he will embellish them, and then some people, other people. But yeah, he he didn't mind touchy feely, you know, uh, you know, with it. Yeah, he'd be glad to show them. Uh, and yeah, he was constantly. Yeah, you know, it's it's lucky he never caught anything. Right. Yeah, yeah. Really. Yeah. With, I mean, you know, he he was always his radar was always on, always on for a good looking woman. He just. I heard that he used to give out Rolexes to some of these women and give them like you know gifts and stuff like that. J.J. Dillon told me a great story that one time. I guess Rick got pretty, pretty drunk, pretty hammered. They're all partying and stuff. Rick goes to his room with this girl. JJ goes to his room in the morning. He's going to head down, get some breakfast and stuff. Rick is still sleeping. He sees the girl in the elevator and he looks at the girl's watch and he's like, that's Rick's like $30,000 Rolex. And JJ had another one, like not a $30,000 one, like a way yeah. cheaper one. But so he, he told the girl that they're switching the watches. So he gave her the cheaper one and he took it back. He goes, Rick, $30,000 Rolex. But he, <laughs> he saved Rick from, uh, I guess Rick was so, you know, maybe had too much to drink because he was partying too much. He gave her the wrong watch. He always had too much to drink. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I don't see how he kept in shape, you know, with the amount of alcohol he drank, you know, and, and, and he was excuse me, Rick. If, excuse me, Rick. If you hear this, that <laughs> when Rick was in the hospital and, and uh, we thought he was going to die, you know, they had him in intensive care. Well, they had to give him an alcohol drip because he was going through the DTs too. So, yeah, that guy just, you know, it's he only he had a certain level of alcohol in his body constantly. And it's crazy because he might be in the best shape of anybody. 60 yeah. minute man, you know, every night. I mean, man, it's just crazy. And Dr. Tom was just talking to him. He said that he would work out with Flair for only for a short period of time when they were together. He was puking and he said he was in great shape. He goes, and Flair's laughing. You know, he's got, you know, he just was an incredible athlete. All right. Rick was not a big weightlifter. You know, uh, I know at his home, he had a Stairmaster when that was, he'd wear him out, just wear him out. I mean, he was on that. He, you know, that he and Tully too, uh, in the in the dressing room would do step ups. You know, you have a chair or a bench there, and they would constantly do step ups. And it wasn't anything from the, them to do five hundred Hindu squats. You know, it just, you know, it's just what they do. You know, and yeah, it's to me, it was amazing. You know how how then they. Go right out and drink. And and I think, too, because Rick was not so uh, thick as far as muscle, you know, the weightlifter that the, wasn't so tight that he could take the punishment without anything really ripping, you know, that he was in shape. Yes, he would lay, lift some weights. But there again, he was limber enough and his lungs. And uh, by the way, too, Rick is so an asthmatic. Think about that. And yeah, it. Uh, I remember when he first came in, he was taking a. So they had a powder. You uh, breathe through this inhaler thing, and and yeah, you know, he was doing that. But yeah, his win is. I don't. I don't see how people do it. You know, keep. I don't see how he does it, or other people keeping up with him. For anybody to go a, a, an hour or ninety minutes in a match, come on. He was doing it sometimes twice a night, sometimes yes. you know, like yes. every night for seven days in a row. Yeah, crazy, right? Especially when he was uh, world champion. There again, you know, uh, you can't beat him, sort of. So you know, it's a DQ or it's a time limit. You know, it's an hour time limit. So you're going to wrestle, you know, an hour, or, or then they say, "Well, we'll do ninety minutes." Well, you wrestle ninety minutes. So, I love that fact that. They need another another opponent for Flair. You know, mid eighties. We're going. We're mm -hmm. starting up Great American Bash. Why don't we use the announcer and have him take the Russian sickle from this three hundred pound monster? <laughs> 
Why don't we have that happen? So Nikita Koloff knocks your blocks off, and you know it kind of sets off Flyer and Nikita. Who is that, uh, is that? Your idea to do that? No, it was not my idea. No, it was not. It was uh, no, no Dusty, Dusty, and and Jimmy, and they were afraid to ask me. They were afraid to ask me. They'd already talked to uh, Nikita about it, uh, and he he was giddy. Oh, he had goosebumps. Well, he, he said, "I," he said, "I had so much fun hitting you with that sickle." Yeah, and he's but, a scary yeah. Guy. I, I, I asked, uh, and I was, you know, and why do you want me to do it? You know that I'm not gonna take it. Just, you know, they had to. Exp- explain it in detail why and what was going to take place afterwards. And so I finally agreed to it. And, you know, it was like running through the yard when you were a kid at night and, you know, you're playing chase or tag and you didn't realize there's a clothesline there. And all of a sudden, zip. Yeah, and because I didn't know when he was going to do it, but you could see the the gleam in his eye. Yeah, and it was so he got it. He was not light on that either. No, he was not. He was snug. Yes. Yeah. But hey, to he use you as the vehicle, set off Flair versus Nikita. That's pretty good. Right. Know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And just crazy to think how big he was at that point too. Yeah. He then I could. Then I ended up refer- refereeing the match there in Charlotte at the stadium. What do you think about that? Like, what was your experience like that? I mean, that's pretty cool. That cool. was. That was, you know. That was cool. And Ivan Koloff was there in, in Nikita's corner. Uh, that was fun. That was fun. I got, you know, I that, too, to me, I could, you know, seeing two pros work, you know. And I should say three because Ivan, you know, was there. And this, the combination, there was very little talk in the ring, you know, very little as far as what was going on, you know, and, you know, it, but it was good. I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Obviously Rick was leading Nikita at that point. Right. Oh yes. Yes. You know, and then Ivan would just sort of come in uh, just every now and then he would sort of listen to the crowd and uh, would then, you know, okay. He felt that this is time for me me to come in and talk about himself. And he would do it or get partial in, and I'd push him out, and the kid would try to do something. And then, you know, that's, you know, position. So I didn't have to pay attention to Nikita and Rick. And Nikita could sneak something in because I would turn and take, you know, Ivan out. So, but the toughest one for me was Art Nelson. Wrestler Art Nelson, uh, he had a boxing match, and I was his second and our t- tape fist boxing match. And I had to gig him, cut him. Yeah. The first time I'd ever done, you know, oh, oh, you can feel it. He said, deeper, kid, deeper. You know, because that was just thought. Uh, you know, doing it, you know, like a have a like the, the the stick that boxers would, you know, the manager would hold over the eyebrow to, to, to and but that had a razor, razor blade on it. Yeah, you know, wow. Yeah, imagine I said, all right, deep. you never did it before. Imagine you go too deep. No, never did. And yeah, and, and that's what I was afraid of. But you know, I've seen guys, you know hit themselves the wrong way and they hit a vein and it just starts, you know, pulsing out. And that I didn't want, but damn, they trusted you though. Oof. Yeah. Yeah. Many the many duties of uh David Crockett. <laughs> we didn't even you, mention the best one. The best you one? A, you a commentary. Oh Lord. Well you know I I Jimmy and I tossed a coin and the loser had to announce. So I lost and I had to announce. Well, Tom Miller, who was our announcer and we were at WRAO 
in Raleigh. And Tom was uh, a little tipsy that night. And we just looked, we said, he can't go on. There's no way. So we flipped a coin and I lost and that's how it started. Had you ever done commentary before? No. Wow. So just throw, throwing you out there with Tony Schiavone of all people. No, well, no. At first it was Bob Cottle. Oh, okay. Bob like Cottle, that. and I learned quite a bit from Bob. Uh, and then you know, Tony, when Tony came in, Tony was the announcer for the baseball team that we had. And we need, you know, I wanted to back away some because I wanted to be in the TV truck. And so uh, Tony came down. And uh, so we did two shows. You know, one was uh, the NWA and the other was Worldwide or something. And, and so we do two hours on Wednesday nights, Tuesday nights. That's right. And uh, and so I did it with him some, and he also did it with Bob Cottle. And that's how you got to start in wrestling. Look at that. Oh, yeah. thanks to you. And look at him still going today. He's still on TV. Yeah. Doing great. He's got a book, I think. Yes. Right? Comic book. Co comic book. Okay. Yeah. He, uh, he's an all-time great to me. I, I love I love Tony. He's just a natural. But you guys, you guys, you know, created the beast, if you will, of Tony. Yeah. Schreiber. True true natural. And, you know, he, he actually studies it, you know, as far as the – uh, he's like an encyclopedia of wrestling, you know, it's as far as the, the talent and what their favorite hold is and background and so forth. Yeah. I, I know knew some of it, you know, uh, but I also knew the wrestlers too and, and what their moves were. And I, I'm just a big fan. Yeah. Uh, when I announced I couldn't, if it was a bad match, I couldn't fake it. Could not fake it at all. But that's what I liked about you. You were so authentic. If there's a big moment, <laughs> you're like you're gonna go nuts. But I love that as a as a fan because you get into it like, oh my god, this is great. But if it's a stinker, as a fan, you know it's a stinker. And I love like you know, it's so authentic. It's like yeah, the announcer kind of knows it stinks too. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But I we'll love talk the about the weather or anything else. We won't yeah. talk about the match. The enthusiasm was awesome though. I love oh, that, especially you and Tony you. together. Yeah. Yeah, we had a good time doing that. Yeah, it, it really was fun. If you go back, remember when Nikita turned babyface with Dusty after the Magnum incident? Right. And Ole and JJ in the cage, you go nuts, which is awesome because it's matching. <laughs> the, the crowd is going absolutely ape. You know, they're going oh, yes. But you match the intensity. I love it. That's one of my, like, favorite – not matches, like, it's so short, but, I mean, my favorite right. moments. Well, that and, – and I – when we had – Rock and Roll Express uh, wrestling, was it the Anderson or the Midnight Express? They went the full show. And I was yelling and screaming so much that I was hoarse after the end of the show. That I, it, and it was an exciting match. You, I mean, you, you had to be. Even Bob Cottle, he was uh, announcing with me at that time. He was... He strained his voice. Yeah, but yeah, that fun. Gotta love the business, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you, you gotta you have to. Yep. You know, it, it only eats you alive if you don't. You think about it, it's 24 7, 365 days out of the year. I, you know, you know all the holidays, you know, we work. Uh, you know, that. I, my family uh, suffered quite a lot for that. I, you know, I wasn't here for birthdays or, you know, every Christmas we had a wrestling match. Every Thanksgiving we had a wrestling match. You know, Fourth of July, no, we didn't wrestle Fourth of July, but we wrestled the third and the fifth. You know, and so, you know, that's the traveling. You know, uh, 
Delta Airlines, I had close to 3 million miles. Whoa. Yeah. Damn. Yeah. That's, well, that was with, uh, you know, Turner. And Eastern Airlines uh, and Piedmont were the ones as far as out of Charlotte, you know, at that time. And had quite a few on those, too. You know, and, and, you know, just going back and forth to Atlanta sometimes. So, yeah, it, it, you know, it, and, but I had a, my wrestling family and my regular family. You know, and that's, you know, it, that's the way it is. You know, it's, uh, you, know, I'm, you know, the fans, you know, you, you, know, you fans or fans are family. You know, without you, we could have not done what we did. You know, it's sort of the chicken and the egg, I guess. You know, who comes first? Or, or and oh man, you know the I feed off of the fans. I feed, you know, the fans get me going, and the, the you know the the wrestler. You know, that helps. But then, you know, the fans help the wrestler, too. You know, think about COVID and, and you know, these uh, WWE and AEW wrestling with no fans. That's hard. I mean, that, that really is hard. You know, because you don't know if you're really doing something exciting or not. You get no response. You know, so you have to have the fans. That was one thing wrong with WCW when we started doing so much video and talking and no matches. The fans just sort of poo pooed it. You know, that, you know, they wanted to see wrestling, they wanted to be entertained. They didn't want to watch a TV monitor or uh, a video. You know, just, and we wanted to take two shows instead of one. Well, then, you know, you it's dead time. And, you know, especially during the week, you've got people with their kids. They need to go to school the next day and you got to get back. You know, then what somebody came up with the idea of having bands play you know, uh, during the, the video breaks and so forth. And now it, they came, for, you know, not for a band, they came for wrestling. Yeah, that, was one, that, that was one of the problems that I saw. Got to have that crowd involvement, and they yeah. weren't happy with a lot of that, yeah. No, we're not. I feel like those long shows too exhaust the crowd. Maybe the guys backstage don't realize it, but the crowd exhausted. Four-hour mark? <laughs> Check it out. Yeah, too yeah. long. Yeah. And the matches don't get, you know, especially TV matches. Now, pay-per-view match, a little different story. You're trying to, you know, you, you know but TV, uh, a lot of squash matches, and, and it's just not enough to keep them pumped up. You know, yeah. you have to have some highs and lows, beginning, middle, and end. But uh, where that in between was, you know, the lows were too low, too long. Definitely. Yeah. With you and, and the Crockets and just, you know, NWA, WCW in general, do you have any regrets like looking back? Anything you wish you would have done differently? Sure. You know, that not outrun the money, you know. That uh, if we went, if we were sold to Turner, I'd like it to be under our terms, not his terms. Uh, you know, maybe I should have, you know, run the company. But I just, you know, I don't know. I, you know, there again, I'll go back. Hindsight's twenty twenty. Uh, a lot of things n not doing the same. You know, it's just it's just life. Come on, you know, it's sure. You know, uh, would I want to 
be like Vince, billionaire. Hmm. Maybe. I don't know. What would I do with all that money? Yeah. You know, money doesn't buy you everything. You know, that, you know, you know as you well know, a wonderful family. You know, that money's not going to buy you. That time with your, you know, more time with my kids. Yes, definitely. Definitely. I Matter of fact, I, I told my children afterwards, uh, I can't make up for the time I missed with you, but with my grandchildren, which I have four. And I said, I'm not going to miss anything with them. And so, uh, and I, I don't, you know, I, I'm the silly grandfather. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Spoil them. Yeah. Oh, yes, definitely. Yeah. I have a good time with them. One of them's 18 now. So, you know, yeah. Growing up fast. Yes. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. Now, with you and your brother, obviously, did you guys always have a good relationship or was the Rocky? Because I, I could have sworn I remember that you guys didn't talk for a while, but then you guys kind of reconciled. Is that true? Yes, we didn't talk for a while. It was. Jimmy made his deal with Turner. Before. He even came to talk to us about it. Yeah. And he said, Hey, you guys do do your thing. You know, I've already got my deal. Uh, so I, golly, quite a few years. Uh, you know, they're good because I fought, fought it, even though I was the one that, you know, I and Jackie, uh, Got through it. I didn't talk to him for quite a few years because I, I think, you know, I was firmly convinced he let his ego get in the way of good business sense. That's, and, and I have to blame myself. Come on. You know, I, I can't just blame him. You know, I, the longest time I just wanted to, you know, take him out back. But, you know, that, you know, I should have, uh, I saw it, you know, and I should have just, you know, I don't know what, you know, that once, once it, he went to Dallas, he and Dusty, it, that's, it was beginning of the end. And we could have, and Mid-South, uh, there again, I, to this day, I, we shouldn't have bought them. We just could sit there and wait until they they filed Chapter 11, whatever it is, and taking it over then. Pick up the pieces. And then take some of the talent, like Stan. Yeah, yeah. And not, and not the debt. Yeah, and not the building. You know, the rent, the lease on that building. Yeah, God, what a nice looking building, too, it was. Uh, it is crazy. The airplanes, you know, you know, they're, you know, the, the deal with uh, Jim Babb and Jefferson, uh, the governor of North Carolina was willing to help us then. So, you know, it was, he wouldn't listen to it, would not. And the governor at that time, Jim Martin, was a good friend of his. You know, but they ended up calling me because Jimmy wouldn't take his call. Jimmy wouldn't take Jim Babb's call either. Hmm. Yeah. It's crazy to look back and say, like, wow, it's just thriving. One of the greatest territories of all time, all of a sudden gone. Turner scooped it up. And and yeah. obviously then, then, you know, 13 years later, Turner's gone. It just, man, wrestling business is crazy. But Vince still, you know, still doing his thing, making yeah. billions of dollars. And I have to say, I am very happy that he is in that. It shows that you don't have to be a television person, you know, to do well in television. You know, that was, you know, you're a wrestling company. You can't do this as well as, you know, I graduated from Southern Cal, you know, film school. Big deal. Yeah. <laughs> right. 
So, okay. yeah. That... So as we head for towards the finish here, head towards the wind down, I just got to know, do you have like favorite wrestlers like for yourself, like, like Nate and Dusty, like, do you have favorites or it's like impossible to think like, ah, I don't really have anybody favorite, even as like a commentator, anybody that like really stuck out, like you really enjoyed. Oh, I, I enjoyed, you know, with the four horsemen, those interviews were just, I'd have to back away. And because I was laughing, I mean, just the comments they come up with Roddy Piper. Oh, I could listen to him all day long. He was just, you know, off the wall. A great individual, too. Really was. He was so into his interviews. I mean, he would study. He had a notebook, and he would write down. We'd ride down the road, and he would write down comments that were being made on the radio or so forth. And, you know, I like this. And, and then it goes on and, and he was very current in his conversations uh, on, on television. Uh, I guess, you know, I did so much with Rick and the four horsemen uh, and Roddy. Uh, that was so current, but yeah, I, Those would be my group, I guess you might say. Pretty good group right there. Yeah. Yeah. As far as like things you didn't get accomplished, like did you ever want to work for WB or nah, did, no way, like you could never work there. Does, does that ever like cross your mind? It crossed my mind, but they told told us, told me that it wouldn't happen. You know, when they came in and uh, the, the last night I we come in and back to the office and they have security people there and shut all the phones off. And, you know, uh, they, they, you know, watch you about what, what you can take out of the office and, you know, all that. And then they make this, you know, this comment, you know, have us in this room that, you know, would be willing to, you know, consider, you know, people here, which is, was a joke yeah so did you ever have a conversation with vince or no never i've talked to vince before but not afterwards no no uh i you know, I, I i don't know if i you know i understand there's a lot of yelling and screaming going on i wouldn't stand for that you know i no when you yell and scream you've lost lost control you know, that, you know, you can go back outside and once you get control, then you can talk to me. But yelling and screaming, man, that all, all that does is make me shut down. You know, I, no, I learned that with the Red Cross. I had some manager uh, person when I was first, I went to Katrina in Monroe, Louisiana. And this guy was yelling and screaming at me. I looked at him. I said, you go outside and get control of yourself. And when you do, you can come back in and talk to me. But this is not going to happen. I said, what are you going to do? You're going to fire me? I'm a volunteer. You're going to send me home? Oh, that's terrible. You're going to cut my pay? You don't pay me anything. So, you know, I'll be glad to go home but you've lost control and you need to get control. Then I'll talk to you. So I, I, I probably could not, you know, now seems like AEW. Sure. Oh, yeah. Hey. yeah. Tony Khan. Give Tony that. Khan. Hey, Tony Khan. <laughs> How you doing, Tony? <laughs> hey, he loves bringing in legends. Look, hey, Sting is uh, over there wrestling. Look, oh yeah. He loves bringing in legends. Wrestle. Now I did do, uh, when they were here in Charlotte, I did s do some commentating over Dark and Elevation with yes, Tony. Remember, yes, yep. Tony, uh, and I. I told Tony Khan afterwards. I said we made a mistake. I said I didn't realize how much I missed it until I did it. And yes, I I do miss it uh, more than I really thought. You know, I I had saw everything. 
pushed down. Everything was, you know, quiet, had all this stuff in boxes and put away and, you know, carrying on with my life and, you know, you know, work in the yard, uh, do, you know, a lot of different things, grandkids and you name it, volunteer. And then you do this. And I, hmm, there's something burning inside me that I, I wonder if I need to push. I don't know. And well, I, I it would take, up. it would take, uh, I would need to learn the talent, learn their moves. You know, there would definitely be uh, study time, you know, time to watch tapes, be around the talent, get to know them. Yeah, I mean, you know, with WCW and uh, JCP, you know, I knew the talent. I knew them inside and out. I got drunk with them, you know, that we'd eat and uh, sleep and, you know, uh, go on trips together, and party together. So, you know, I, I knew their families. So, you know, that was easy. You know, to the, the new breed, hmm, you know. Do you watch I don't know. I don't know if I. Uh, I would probably have to voice my opinion. I don't know if that's allowed. <laughs> right, probably not. Yeah. So, do you watch a lot of current wrestling or not really? Not really. I I watch AEW just because I I'd like to see them succeed. Uh, we need another. We you need two choices. I think Vince made a mistake by not keeping WCW. You know, as they talked about it at first, separate group. You know, sort of challenging each other, which perfectly good sense. You know, uh, even though you can control it, but it didn't work that way for him. I think that you know, for fans, you need you need a choice. You know, between the two, uh, AEWs, you know, they're smaller, they're fast. Uh, there's not as as much production, I guess. I mean, there's I don't talk about the pre-production, but you know, as far as the lights, and pyrotechnics, and so forth, as Vince, uh, you know, he. But don't you shouldn't try to be like Vince. Yeah, you need to be something different. You know, like the that group out of in Atlanta, the NWA, that take their matches so sort of like uh, at TBS, but it's at public television there. You know, I said, okay, that makes sense. You know, be different, be good, but be different. Right. What would you say? is the legacy of the Crockett family, yourself included, obviously, but your dad, Jimmy, Jackie, Francis, even Debbie does a Crockett Foundation. I mean, what's the, uh, what's the, um, the legacy, the stamp? That we left an impression. We've left memories to people of, your age, older, even now younger people are watching, you know, our wrestling that it gives me a satisfaction that Jimmy and I both thought we failed, you know, with the sale of Turner. And in some ways we did. Uh, but they cannot, we didn't fail when we had it. We, we did not fail because you are talking to me now. Right. You know, fans uh, on Facebook. You know, I, I was, when I went on Facebook, I was blown away. I said, all these people want to be friends with me. I mean, yeah, you know, right now that I think it's about seventeen hundred. I went. This is this is crazy. You know that yeah. people remember. You know, and even Jimmy when I took him to Baltimore. You know, it was for uh, 
Conrad Thomas, you know, that he, Jimmy made the comment when that he said, David, I can't believe these fans remember all this. I said, yeah, they remember more than we do. You know, as far as asking the questions about certain matches and this yeah. and that, I said, that's the legacy that we're still giving joy, you know, satisfaction and entertainment to uh, a, a segment of the population that I'm crazy about. That, you know, we are not, uh, it's middle America. I think that's where where we you know we are that you know that that's the satisfaction that's the legacy that you know that I hope that you know that people still watch it so like on we watch things on uh, Turner Television you know the classic movies you know that this is always going to be classic. That's great. You know, that that that's fine with me. I right? that that would be the legacy that you know that we we have left something that will I hope stand the test of time, maybe. What do I you think, think? I think it has. And then okay. so. All right. All right. I mean, how people are still doing conventions based around all yeah. of you guys from the NWA. It's basically Crockett conventions. Yeah. Before we leave, I, I've got one thing. I used to read a lot of the fan mails that we get at the office, and I got I had one from a, uh, a student at the School of the Blind in North, in North Carolina, talking about how much he enjoyed the matches, and I had to find out what he was talking about. You know, so it's not that far of a trip, and we had a match up in Marion, North Carolina. So I, I went up there and went to look the, the the student up and he said, Oh yeah, we all enjoy it. You know, you know, and he said, watching it, you know, you know, and he said he saw laugh. He said, we can envision, you know, from the way you're talking and the sound uh, of your audio person that you know, we can envision being right there in the ring or ringside. And that was so satisfying to me to, you know, that I, I, I'll never forget that. You know, wow. that powerful. Yeah. Stuff. Wow. That's powerful. Powerful. So he, he felt it. Yeah. Could yeah. You, I mean, he yeah. felt it that. Yeah. And I, I guess maybe that's where I get my enthusiasm from that. I always want, everyone feel like they're they're at ringside you know that they they can feel the pain and the joy love it all right but david thank you so much for all the time this has been an honor for me and great to finally uh, connect with you and talk to you I could talk to you for days but uh, this, <laughs> this has been great thank you so much John, thank you. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I hope that uh, everybody that watches your program uh, definitely enjoys it because uh, I'm trying to, to, I guess, answer the questions that people uh, put in the messages on, on Facebook. Uh, this, I think, is the best way for me to do it. I'd be wrong, but you know, I can get the most people this way. So really, thank you for asking me uh, to be on. I really appreciate it.